seven. Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. We are only seven Patreon supporters away from our next major milestone. For $6 a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a Jackhammer Chatterbait, you will receive 5% off your orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle, 20% off your orders to Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Tackle, 10% off Tiger Crankbaits, 10% off Catoctin Creek Rods. You'll gain access to our Facebook-only community, You'll gain entrance to our weekly and monthly prize giveaways, specific members only content, and so much more. Again, we are only seven Patreon supporters away from our next major milestone. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia, and Shallow Water Fishing Adventures Baits, online, located in Mount Airy, Maryland. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Aarons, and we're heading back to you know Southern Virginia w- with an individual I had on earlier this year to talk about his far away from the Key West to California and then traveling to the glums of Richmond, Virginia area. Uh, Kyle, I'm really happy to get you back on. How are you doing? Stoked to be back here, Thomas. Good to, good to see you again. It's been a couple of months, but some very very fishy months so excited to chat with you it, it really is the last time i think we left you off it was your you got a bass boat you're really getting back into like the tournament stuff and then that got dialed up to 11 because like your your instagram your social media handle the current it seems like you've really kicked that into high gear yeah i've been lucky to have a really good partner my wife is pretty amazing shout out my number one sponsor downstairs. Uh, She lets me get out and I throw the tournament calendar on the calendar early in the year and she knows pretty much every other Saturday he's going to be out and most likely the Friday before that. So between fish and the ABAs, some of the cat this year, um, I've been pretty damn busy. That's awesome. That's really cool. And is this your first, and this is the one thing I my memory bank is not what it used to be. Is this your first year fishing the whole cat and ABA trail with the boat? Uh, so last second? Year, I think I fished most of the summer series last year in the cat James river division might've missed one or two. Um, but I got my boat in the late August last year. So it must've okay. been either the summer or the fall series. Um, and those guys at the cat, Mark Austin, the the guy that runs the Cat James River Division, just a top notch dude, and they run a really tight ship over there. Some really, some serious hammers as well. Uh, well. Let's get right into that then. What was it like this being your first spring doing the cats down there on the James? Did you feel like there was a big learning curve going into that? What was your expectations, dude? I. I thought I had some spots nailed down. I I grew up as we talked about in Florida in the last episode. So tide is not, it's not foreign to me by any means. Snook, redfish, tarpon, bonefish, all the regular haunts in South Florida, they work on the same, the same game as, as a bass does in tidal water. And I, I thought I had the tide game figured out my, my good day is these hammers bad bad day so it's been it's been tough i'm i'm lucky that i have a job and a wife a job that pays me well a wife that allows me to donate for now um so i i put myself in the donator category at the moment but it's been a really really eye-opening experience and one thing i'd recommend to anyone thinking about fishing tournaments is just talk to everybody network get as much learning as you can while you're in those things as you possibly can what was the biggest learning takeaway for you looking back at at what you've done so far so in the last episode we talked about being a co-angler i i actually found a lot of value out of being a co-angler a lot of the pro level guys talk about that being a great way to come up um i fished say three BFLs last year as a co-angler. Um, I drew some really cool dudes, um, had a grit, never had a bad time with any of them. And they were all experienced people that have been fishing tournaments for a while. So just seeing the decision-making for me 
was really important because I can get laser focused and think that even if I cast in the same spot over and over again, like these, you know, we give the example of the Japanese guys that start on shore Mm -hmm. and they swap through 37 different lures, but cast in the same exact spot and finally get a a fish to bite I'm that guy. (laughs) So it was cool to just figure out like, all right, let's move. All right, let's move. All right, let's move. And it's all because X, Y, and Z. So decision making was eye opening and I've been getting better at that. Just really making the right decisions in the moment and even more so making the right decisions before you even make them. So research for me, whether it's for fishing, for work, everyday life, like I'm a die hard. I'm on YouTube trying to figure things out. I'm on like for fishing, Omnia Pro. I'm on my active captain on Google Earth. I'm figuring shit out before I even get into the situation. That map study is so freaking important, especially if it's a place that you've never been to before. And I, and, and I get it. Like, I think there's two strains of anglers out there where it's the person that's never been there before and the person that's been there the 30th time. And, you know, that information is probably not as needed to that person. But yeah, if, if you're going to a place for your very first time, uh, yeah, you got to get the map studying in. Use your Google Earth. A Google Earth Pro, I've talked to a bunch of people about. You can go back 10 to 15 years to see the place when it's a little bit shallower. You know, Navionics, whatever chip manufacturer that you really like, there's so many ways that you can get ready before you ever hit the water. It's true. It's true. I mean, and social media technology the way it is right now, man, we've got more access to information than ever. I mean, everyone's talking about it. This is nothing new. But for a guy like me that loves fishing but hates just getting defeated, which I've I've been defeated quite a few times. Like I'm diehard winter fisherman. I, I don't hunt at all. So, I mean, if it's snowing, I'm, I don't care if it's raining, what do I care? I got a rain suit. Uh, so I'm, I'm out there regardless. And sometimes I'm getting skunked. It sucks, but beat my head against the wall and figure out what I did wrong, why I did it wrong and how to change over time. What you're going from like the James River to Lake Gaston, like what where are the places that you've had tournaments this year? Uh so I fished first tournament of the year, I fished down on uh Hartwell actually. I fished the first uh the first BFL in the South Carolina series, I think it was. Um had a fantastic practice, just found the big spots, uh on some obvious areas that was that were all close to green pond and that that tournament turned out to be scary uh it was like a 98 person bfl i drew a stick this dude just he's been fishing hartwell for 30 years and i basically caved and i listened to everything that he said I wiped all of my past days knowledge out, all of my mm. practice. I didn't hit a single spot that I had found in practice and just listened to this guy. He whacked him from the back of the boat. Just whacked him. Finished third on the co-angler side, caught 11 pounds, just dragging a freaking football jig in the back of the boat and throwing a shaky head. And he was basically telling me, all right, point the boat that way. And I'm too nice of a guy. Like I'm just listening to him. I don't know this area. Wind was blowing 35 miles an hour. So I was trying to keep it safe and I was putting him in the position every time it was, Mm. it was rough watching him catch three to one for me. And that was, that was the first one of the year. Um, I fished the ABA a couple of times. Uh, I think it's Division 13. Um, so Kerr, Gaston, James we've been on. Uh, and then one out of the Chick out of Route 5. And then I fished the Cat Open out of Osborne. That was uh, either late March or early April. What but is I've that? Been all year. Don't what, is, what is that like fishing the James from two different perspectives? Because those are the big ramps, Osborne and the Chick, honestly, are ramps, but areas that you launch from. It, does it give, do you fish it differently depending on where you launch from or are you going to the same areas come hell or high water? I might be, 
an oddball out. I don't have the biggest boat, biggest motor, and it's 18 foot aluminum Triton with a 115. So, I mean, I'm cruising at 4,800 RPMs going 35. So I'm not going far. So if I'm at Osborne, the furthest I'm going is probably a little past Hopewell, like not very far. So it certainly, it changes the game for me. If we launch out of Hopewell, I'll go out, out. Like I'm going to the creeks that are further out. Uh, if I'm launching at Osborne, I'm fishing the barges or I'm fishing any mm. of the pits um, and then any of the main river stuff. If I'm fishing the chick, I'm staying in the chick. If you're in a small boat, at least from my comfortability, it's easier for me to keep my line in the water the entire time versus just having a slog in a slow boat. I mean, the benefit, I guess, would on the flip side would be you can get pretty shallow in that thing. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's going to be a hell of a lot shallower than, you know, an 18-foot glass boat or a 20-foot glass boat, but you definitely can. I mean, I've gotten myself in some sticky scenarios uh, back of a creek right by uh, Brickyard Landing. There's a, there's a little creek that's just below Brickyard in Chickahominy, and found myself in there at low tide and had to literally push pull myself out with a uh with a net then <laughs> like an hour later i finally got out it was quite a quite a scenario mm. so w- when you're bouncing between lakes and, and ri- or lakes in the river do you try to keep the same techniques is that really where you're trying to be comfortable or what excuse me uh that's that was a beer burp uh <laughs> The, uh, I mean, I think my technique is, is always based on time of year, what stage the bass are in, you know, what have I heard doc talk like, I'll, I'll listen to doc talk a little bit. Um, and not referencing your, your, your doc talk, but literal doc talk. Um, yeah, I mean, if I'm fishing Lake Anna or I'm fishing Gaston or I'm fishing Kerr, like I'm fine with throwing a Tamiki rig all day. If I'm fishing the James. I mean, that, that rod stays with a drop shot on it. So no, I'm fishing, fishing the moment, fishing the situation really. And that really segues into like Lake Gaston, the Lake Gaston monster. Like what was that like prepping for that event? Man, it was, it was interesting. So that was my first time fishing it. So for the ABA, I think it was early mid April. No, no, May. The first time I fished it was May 6th and the, uh, the tournament was the weekend after. Uh, and I did a lot of research. I spent time on YouTube. I watched countless hours, uh, you know, researched on Instagram, on TikTok, all the informational platforms I could find. Digitally, I'm trying to get info. And then I turned to my maps. I, you know, ha- like I mentioned, have Omnia Pro. So really looked at the current situation, what the water temp was, what the wind direction was, used all the stuff that that app is really known for, um, and then popped into Google Earth. So like you mentioned, I have Pro, and it it's it's definitely useful to turn back time on places like Gaston and Kerr. You can really identify mm-hmm. some clubs where you know fish are going to be. Um, and that my first practice, we caught... We fished a we fished a real full day, like a six a.m. till six p.m., uh, and we caught thirteen pounds of fit five for five fish. I caught one uh, spot that was just sitting on a flat, like a random flat um, that was just, I mean, looked like he had a watermelon in his stomach. Was right under four pounds, uh, throwing a Demiki rig, and really the the obvious spots where fish should have been, they were there in practice, just uh, flat out. Like if they were on a, if you went up to a point, you'd find bait, you'd find fish. Hmm. If you found a rock pile, you found a brush pile, they were there. I mean, it was, it was honestly not hard. Like we caught a lot of two, two and a half pound spots. We actually didn't run in. I have not run into a single largemouth on Gaston. Uh, but like I mentioned, uh, practice was good. 13 pounds would have been a really good day on Derb Day. 
So next weekend comes, um, I'm thinking uh, where I put in for practice was way down river or way down lake. Um, I don't remember the creek arm, but the main, the really big creek arm. Um, I'll have to look it up. I have it open right oh, here. Uh, oh, shit. I'm looking at chest and not a uh, Holly. No, P Hill. P Hill. The one the, that Fr the Virginia Creek. Yeah, exactly. Um, we stayed in P Hill most of the day. We came out of it a little bit, but everything came in P Hill. And then we launched on Derb Day, way up river. Um, what the heck is that called now? It was one of the ramps that was close to like the real river section. So totally different area. Um, day of comes, there's probably, the turnout was, was bad. Main 15 people total. I think it was only 12 boaters and with the ABA you can uh, jump in as a non-boater, which is the strangest structure I have ever experienced in a tournament series. Um, sidebar, I've gotten picked to be uh, with a non-boater three derbs in a row, which is kind of a pain in the ass when you got a little boat. Uh, yeah, I, and I, I want to circle back to that. We'll circle back to that because I, I have some thoughts on that. Um, I got really lucky. That was the first one I didn't get drawn, thankfully. Um, so I ran straight out of that creek that I was in. I'll, it'll come back to me where we were and booked it to uh, just a, a rock wall rip wrap and Shad Spawn was on. It was on on every single point that I hit and Second, I threw a spinner bait up there. Boom. I mean, boom, 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 boom. They were all one and a half pound spots. Filled my limit in like 30 minutes, maybe. And then just could not find big fish. I ran all the way down to P Hill thinking that, let me go recreate what I did in practice. The same spots, hit my points, hit my little ditches that I found some fish in. Uh, I even had some spawners that were there the weekend before. I probably shouldn't even have wasted my time, uh, but I just could not upgrade. I ended up having, I want to say it was like nine pounds, something like that. A bunch of just, just little stinkers. It was frustrating. And everyone that was in the top or in the money, I guess it was only like three or two guys that made money in a 15 person field had all large mouth, all, all large mouth. And I just could not find large mouth. It was, it was yeah. It's interesting when you get this, this invasion of the Alabama bass, where it creates this dichotomy where you have to go pursue large mouth. You have to find them. Uh, it's not just you go anywhere you're going to find them. You literally, that's the whole goal because you can catch three pounds all day long anywhere on those places. Um, that's crazy, dude. Yeah, it's such a weird diet. Again, it, it's a it's a weird thought to be like, I know I'm going to catch five, but it's going to be worth nothing versus you go to like, I don't know, like the chick or something like that. And it's like, you just want to catch your five and they will be the right size. Right. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, it was it was a fresh the the day of the tournament was pretty frustrating. Uh, I knew where the right size spotted bass or Alabama bass were. I just could not get myself to recreate the scenario I had last weekend, and honestly, conditions were almost spot on. Um, so, first time at Gaston fishing the tournament, it wasn't the greatest, but I. I will likely be back to Gaston. I, I personally enjoy catching spots. Uh, the fact that, you know, you're always going to fill out a five fish bag is fun. Like I, I like catching fish. <laughs> uh, quantity is fun for me. Quality is also great, but Gaston certainly is a, a quantity place. When we're talking about the, the differences between the James and Gaston, and then you had another trip where you decided to go overseas what what spurred that on? So I work for uh, an Italian coffee company. Uh, they're based in the northeast of Italy, and they they uh, we had like a global marketing meeting that I went over for. It was Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, 
my wife granted me the extended time off to head up on on the Friday before that. So I spent the whole weekend in Italy. And then the back half, I went to Slovenia to go mountain biking. But cool. first half, I fished. Um, so about an hour away from uh, the Venice airport is the Grotto Lagoon. It's another, it's very similar to the Venice Lagoon. Um, just a bunch of backwater. It's all tidal water. Um, and it looks honestly super similar to the Chesapeake Bay. Hmm. Like, I mean, grass flats, uh, it, it's got a very similar look. The water and the vegetation does. Um, lots of like rocks, lots of riprap, uh, grass flats, mud flats, you name it. It's, it's very similar. Um, so we fished a lot of the way you would in like a late spring. So mostly top water. Um, one of the most interesting things I thought we, we pretty much fished a paddle tail, like a four and a half inch hmm. Kytec looking bait. It's an Italian manufacturer that they had. It was a little, little wider than a Kytec and it had a small little wire weight on the front of the just, uh, EWG hook. And we would just drag those on top. Let the let the uh, paddle tail flutter in the back, kind of look like a whopper plopper, but you were just burning a paddle hmm. tail bait in eight inches of water. I mean, I'm talking eight inches, and you'd sling it as far as you could, and you'd all of a sudden see these fish just come out of nowhere and just oh, that's so cool. It was, it was awesome. It was really really cool. Um, hmm. So shout out to my sponsor, my wife, uh, for allowing me to do that. It was really fun. Were those were those our type of bass that you were catching, or what was the species? So most people would be familiar with them by their name, Bronzino. Uh, it's a it's pretty common uh, fish that you can eat, and I mean even here, um, B R A N Z I N O. It's a a sea bass. Uh, it looks a lot like kind of looks like a weak fish or a trout mixed with the striper. Um, but they get probably 15, 20 pounds. So very, very similar to a trout, really. Um, they've got a white mouth versus like an orange mouth as a trout would have or a, a sea trout would have. But pretty similar in their, their behavior, for sure. Hmm. I'm actually looking at some... Saying how to do this. People are hyped on the bronzino over there and the one one thing i when i go back for another meeting i certainly want to get back over there and fish again these guys have a lot of different fish we actually saw a uh, bluefin tuna air 100 yards away from the boat as we were running on the outside really uh, like 10 feet of water and supposedly you can catch bluefin tuna in like on a kayak. My guide had told me a story about him hooking a bluefin on his kayak while he was fishing for bronzino. That's insane. How big was it? The bluefin like over a hundred pounds. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I thought it was a dolphin. He was <sighs> like, no, it's a dolphin. They're not here right now. Yeah. Was law probably in like the, <sighs> 150 250 range i mean like that's a insane five five and a half footer yeah. holy crap dude that's Yard freaking fish. oh that's so cool that's really yeah. cool where else do you want to go and fish hmm well it's father's day this weekend so i'm planning on taking my uh camper i've got a truck bed camper um that we go camping and take the boat with us um Last weekend, we went out to Back Bay, which was my first time out there. Another conversation we could have. That place is cool as hell. Um, but this weekend, I'm trying to figure out where to go. Like, bucket list right now, local. I really want to go to Moomaw. I've, mm. I've just, a, just this feeling about Moomaw. And I know you've talked to some people about it before. It, it sounds really really cool and something comparable to some stuff that I used to fish back in Northern California. Um, uh, those looking lakes where super deep, big, small mouth and not super pressured. Uh, I'm, I'm really wanting to get there. 
Lake Mumal is a special place for sure. I mean, it's a completely different kind of cat. It's a little bit smaller. Um, trout are a real big forward species there, but I think there's going to be some monsters that come out of there. Um, yeah, no, a hundred percent, dude. That's a, that's a good place to go. Back Bay is interesting because I've heard of its rumors and that's a place I really want to go. What is it like? Is it just like a swampy cypress filled area? Is it a lot of grass fishing? Like a little bit of everything? All grass. I mean, you can't get out of the grass there. We stayed at the North Bay Shore campground. It's on the north side. Um, and we got a campsite that we could pull the camper, back it up, and be on a canal. I dropped the boat in on Saturday morning, and it stayed right behind us the whole weekend. It was, I mean, awesome. You That's just cool. literally walk out of the camper, walk right onto the boat, throw the trolling motor in the water. And I caught more fish in that little canal where the campground was than I caught anywhere else. That's crazy. And it was just covered in grass, covered with just lay downs and lots of stuff for them to hide under. And I threw nothing but top water. I was hooked on this Italian technique of throwing the paddle tail. So I was just just skipping under anything I could find and burning a paddle tail. Hmm. They were biting six in the morning on the the burn they were biting at 12 in the afternoon on the burn and it was 90 degrees out and they were biting at night i even went out on saturday night at like 11 p.m i mean it was it was wild you're fishing in like between two and five feet of water i didn't see anything deeper than five feet of water and we made it all the way out to the middle of the bay it's a very shallow, shallow area with lots of grass. When you brought that technique home, did you make any adjustments to it? Were you still throwing the four inch? Did you go to a little bit heavier hook? Like what, what adjustments did you make of any? I didn't do much change. I don't have any of that wire. I pro actually, I probably do on my fly tying gear, but like the wire, I think was the deal for them. They could get the weight or get the, uh, the hook shaft turned down a bit more, so it was pretty close to the eye where they'd set it up, and it would make it so the nose would stay down and the tail would just float like right above the water. So I think they had it dialed in, and I negated that that little that little technique, and I kept getting it hung up, kept getting – I just couldn't burn it – exactly the way that they were setting it up um so that was the only change that i made but still work like a charm i mean sling it as far as i could and just fast as i can back and you'd have fish just launching out of the grass for it or launching out of a bush for it it was it was eye opening because i i haven't i don't know why i haven't thought of doing that before it seems so freaking obvious just burn a paddle tail yeah, it's the simplicity of some of these techniques that that are over there that we get so obsessed with the details and and out thinking the room. And when you come back with these like like uh, uh, the the minnow jig, like the idea, like just getting a little bait to do, it's basically crappie fishing, but you're just quivering a really highly realistic jig, very simplistic, honestly. Uh, and it's the same thing with just skipping a paddle tail. It, it it makes so much sense in the world, but we don't do that over here. And especially in the vegetation of Back Bay, or I'm thinking the Potomac River, something like that would really freaking play. Did, did you did you throw a frog at all or anything like that? Not a bite. Not a single bite. I threw the frog for a while, and I did not get bit. The only thing I could get bit on, a drop shot a Nico rig when I could find the cypress with like no grass around it, I'd, I'd flip the drop shot in there and there was a bite every time pretty much. And like you were saying, is it cypress or grass? That's all it is. It's cypress or grass. Wow. <laughs> That's the only shit you're fishing. Um, the, the grass is so freaking thick there. Like it's, if you don't know the area, it's honestly, to me, it was a little sketchy to run for the first time. Like even getting on plane, you're getting on plane in the middle of this so-called channel. It's 3.2 feet deep. Okay. I mean, you can take off in that, but what happens when it goes to 1.8? Yeah. That's only half the, the depth that yeah. you're just in. That's not <sighs> unlikely. That's freaking insane. Uh, but yeah, I, I swapped through some baits. Literally, that was that was the best thing for 
for the situation that I was in that just burning that thing. And it probably had something to do with my confidence and being so hyped from the weekend prior. Um, just, it felt like I was back in Italy for some reason. What was the biggest one that you ended up catching this weekend or yeah. back? Bay? Yeah. Back um, bay. The first, so I put the boat in the water, didn't turn on the big motor. I just dropped the trolling motor in the water so I could fish back to the boat ramp while my wife was taking care of the baby. Uh, and like right in front of the ramp, uh, like a three, maybe a three, two, a little over three. So nothing, nothing huge, but a lot of fish that were in that like cookie cutter two and a half range. That's awesome. That is definitely a place that's going to be on my list. Hopefully this year to go to uh, what's your, uh, what's your next tournament that you have coming up? Uh, I've got a couple on the, on the, the, the list. I'm trying to figure out if I'm going to continue on with the ABA stuff. Um, we can get back to that one comment. That's kind of run me dry from the ABA. There's, there's two things. Um, the turnout with ABA has been really low. Um, I think the most people I've seen turn up is 24, 25. Uh, and like I mentioned, I've been picked for three different non-boaters and I've only fished five derbs over there. Wow. So to me, that's not, I go out to fish by myself, honestly, I, call me a cheater, call me whatever you want. I'm not winning money. I'm not out there to go cheat. Like I just like to be out there by myself, have my own mindset, have my own game, have my own decision-making set up. Mm -hmm. and, it just, it rubs me the wrong way. Like I get thrown off. Every one of them has just been like, soon as, as soon as they call my boat number, God dang it. <laughs> it's frustrating. So I, I, I've got a couple under my belt and I've only got to fish the two day to get to the regional. I know it sounds like kind of a cop out, but you've only got to fish three one days and one two day to get to the regional down at Murray. And I, Murray's probably one of my favorite places to fish. Um, I, I love that place. It is so much it's fun. It's a really cool lake. So I think I'll, I'll for sure fish the two day in the region 13 ABA. And I'll probably hop back in a couple of the cat cat tournaments. Cause that group of dudes is just a solid bunch of people for sure. And, and the cat trail is solo. Is that the one that you're fishing? The, the solo cat series? It's the team trail, but. It, you can fish it by yourself. Yeah. And they're hope well in route five only. That's why I decided against it this year because of the schedule. I, I really like fishing Kerr. I really like fishing Gaston. Like I like to switch up, not just be on tidal water all the time. Um, and the cat James division doesn't do anything other than, uh, the chick and the James. So I don't know. We'll see. We'll see next year. I really think the solo thing is going to take off. I, I know, I'm pretty sure, comment section let me know if I'm wrong, that, that the cat does have a solo thing. ABA has a solo thing. And when you look at what happens like with the BFLs, where now that you have to do a boater on boater draw, or you know, if you don't find a co-angler, you can't like get, it, it's just, it's a freak, it's mess. It's very messy. And I feel like we are at the preface, preface of something completely different when it comes to the fishing world. And, and you hit it right on the head. It's like, it's not like I'm trying to cheat or whatever. It just it is also kind of nice to be like, I don't have to deal with a co-angler. You know, that's kind of nice, honestly. I love filming when I'm on the boat. Yes. One of those Yolo tech things that go in the back and the, uh -huh. the light fixture. I don't throw that up when there's a co-angler. I'm like, I'm not a total dick. Like, I'm not trying to just fully make it so someone can't fish. So, I mean, I, I don't film when I have a co-angler, which is, for me is it's I'm not going out to film, but I like to be able to, um, you know, that's definitely a negative. And as soon as co-angler or someone else in your boat gets some negative vibes in there, I hate to sound foo-foo, but like I, I'm not down with other people starting to talk shit or like saying, let's go somewhere else. Or, you know, why are you catching them? I'm not like that'll throw me off real quick. 
And it, I, I'm yeah. not a fan of that. It, it's also just part of the game dealing with the co-angler that way. I, I'm a hundred percent though on board with the, the digital media stuff where I like to set up a bunch of cameras and just not have to worry about it. I'm a little bit more messier in the boat. And, and honestly, it's Same, yeah. a purity of the fishing aspect where you don't have someone else to tell you you're right or wrong. And I don't mean that they verbally tell you, but if you're throwing a chatterbait and the guy in the back is throwing a tube and he starts smoking them, that gives you information. Do with it what you will on what you're doing. When it's just you in the boat, it's, it's very pure of, yeah, like, did you catch him or did you not? Yeah, go back to that Hartwell tournament. I didn't expect to just throw a shaky head and a jig only, but the guy in the back of the boat certainly didn't say anything about it, but he, he showed it. He showed the only thing that at the spots we were at, you were going to catch him on a shaky head or, or a football head. That was it. I wanted to throw a jerk bait. I wanted to throw a Demiki rig all day. Like I, I couldn't get him to bite. Like I could not. I could point the live scope right at them. They wouldn't even move. You know Hartwell. I mean, mm -hmm. everyone's got live scope down there. But the fish that I was running into, they didn't seem super affected by it. And I'd hit them right on the nose with it. They'd follow it. Nothing. And meanwhile, <laughs> homie in the back is just smoking them. Downing them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, dude, like that is that is the blue back lake in a nutshell. If they're not smoking them on top, they're going to be hitting them on the bottom. But the hard part is to know when to do what. <laughs> Experience helps, that's for sure. It does. Kyle, I mean, I really appreciate you coming on um, just to kind of get another just look into someone starting back into the fishing community, this tournament fishing and your process as you grow and develop in there. Do you have anything coming up that we can let people know about uh, anything that we can promote with your sponsors? No, my, my, I mean, everyone just comment, uh, thank my wife for letting me fish. <laughs> I mean, uh, no, if you can follow me on Instagram or on YouTube, I'm the current, uh, that's with a K T H E K U R R E N T, uh, updating my content every day, really just trying to get a laugh out of people and inspire people to get on the water as much as they can. Uh, but otherwise no sponsors <laughs> other than myself and my wife as always guys link in the episode description to everything that we talked about uh please like subscribe to the channel it really helps out in the algorithm if you want to go check us out on patreon our overall goal someday is to start that nonprofit to help supplementally stock our fisheries if you like go check us out we'll see you next time on fishing the dmv bye you're listening to fishing the dmv with your host thomas aarons fishing the dmv is brought to you by jake's bait and tackle located in winchester virginia if that doesn't get you jacked up i don't know what will